Here we are, Daniel chapter 6. We're looking at a very famous portion of Scripture, all of us know it, by Daniel in the lion's den. That's what we're looking at. And I chose to uh, entitle this particular installment of our study, He Believed in His God. And you'll see that as we go through the study, why I chose to entitle it that. So beginning at uh, verse 1 in Daniel chapter 6, reading to verse 3, it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom. And over these three governors, of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps might give account to them so that the king would suffer no loss. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. And so we're now introduced to what has been called and is called the second kingdom, the second kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the second kingdom when we went through uh, chapter 2, the second kingdom uh, in this golden image is the Medo-Persian Empire. When we were going through Daniel and we're in chapter 2, the Babylonian king, remember with me, had a, he had a dream. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, and, and we saw that uh, Nebuchadnezzar in his dream had, had a dream of what, would, what was called a great image. And it was described as having a head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, and legs of iron, with feet that were a mixture of iron and clay. And so when the king had said he wanted to know the dream and its interpretation, Daniel had told him that he was the head of gold. And so Nebuchadnezzar represented the Babylonian empire, which was the greatest of the ancient world. And as Daniel was speaking to him, we saw this in chapter 2, he made it clear that the empire of Babylon was temporary, that it was going to be replaced. In chapter 2, verse 39, he said, After you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours. So in Nebuchadnezzar's image, the kingdom was portrayed as the chest and arms of silver. And it's this kingdom that we're introduced to here in chapter 6. It's the kingdom of what was called the Medo-Persian Empire. Now Cyrus, a king, had defeated the Medes, and the kingdom, he was Cyrus of Persia, the kingdom became called the Medo-Persian Empire. And so in our last study, we, uh, we were introduced to, to Darius in chapter 5, verses, uh, verse 31. It says, Darius the Mede received the kingdom being about 62 years old. And so here we have an introduction to Darius. And, and what's happening here is Darius is reordering the Babylonian government. You see, history records that Cyrus the Persian installed Darius as what is called a sub-governor of Babylon. And that's why we're being introduced right now to Darius, because he's the one who's overseeing the nation. And so it says in verse 1, it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom, verse 2, and over these three governors, three, these three governors, of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps might give account to them so that the king would suffer no loss. And so what he did is he established three governors, as it says here, and, and these governors were to oversee what are called the satraps, 120 of them. A satrap was a, a prince. It could be called a prince. It could be called a government official. That's what they were. And what they are are what we would call provincial leaders. And so I cut some information out and pasted it so I could read it to you and look smart. It says that the satraps owned and administered the land in their provinces, always in the king's name. They served as the chief judge for their region, adjudicating disputes and decreeing the punishments for various crimes. Satraps also collected taxes, appointed and removed local officials, policed the roads and public spaces. And so to prevent the satraps from exercising too much power, and possibly even challenging the king's authority, each satrap answered to a royal secretary known as the eye of the king. And that would have been the office that Daniel held. He was the eye of the king. Now, as we begin, once again, Daniel is placed in a position of authority. He is the chief of the governors. 
Now, Psalm 75, 6 and 7 says, Exaltation comes neither from the east nor from the west nor from the south. But God is the judge. He puts down one and exalts another. So God has exalted Daniel to this very high position as the chief over those that uh, were under the rule of the king. And it says in verse 3 that Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps because of an excellent spirit that was in him. And the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. And so Daniel distinguished himself. Now, I want to share a couple of things with you as I introduce this a little further. At this point, Daniel is no longer a young man. Daniel is nearing the age, some commentators, many would say, of around 90. Yeah, he is an old man. He's nearing 90 years of age. But I want you to notice he is still distinguishing himself above others. At the age of 90, he is still distinguishing himself above others. In Psalm 92, verses 12 through 14, listen to what the psalmist said. But the godly will flourish like palm trees and grow strong like the cedars of Lebanon, for they are transplanted to the Lord's own house. They flourish in the courts of our God. Even in old age, they will still produce fruit. They will remain vital and green. They will declare, the Lord is just. He is my rock. There's no evil in him. Daniel received an honor. But that honor that he received isn't an automatic honor just because he's grown old. And this is something I wanted to highlight with us as I introduce this. The honor he receives is because he sought the Lord, but he sought the Lord through his lifetime. In Psalm 71, 5 and 6, it says, You have been my hope, Lord, my confidence since my youth. From birth I have relied on you. You brought me forth from my mother's womb. I will ever praise you. Daniel was able to say that. Daniel was able to say that from his youth, he had served and loved the Lord. He was an honorable man. You know, as Daniel grew older, and he did even as we're looking at this passage, as Daniel grew older, it would be easy, it would have been easy for him to think, my days of usefulness are over. That's, that's one of the lies that the, uh, that the enemy feeds to, to our people today. It's, it's one of the lies that society feeds on when you're old, you, you, you have no use. You, you, and you're old, who wants to listen to some old person up there? I used to say um, when I was young, because I spoke with a loud voice and I could get agitated, I used to say, you know, when you're young, people think you've got a lot of fire. But when you get old and you have the same fire, they think you're just old and grumpy. And there's some truth to that. There's some truth to that. When you're young, you're just filled with the passion, and that's a good thing. When you're old, you're just mean and mad. And society actually has done that. Society has, has relegated those who have aged, even when they've aged well in terms of being um, good people, um, have relegated them to the place where they're not even necessary to be listened to anymore. They don't want to hear them anymore. And it can make a, a person who's growing older feel useless. And yet... That's not true. Uh, the Bible says, and we saw this in the book of Job in chapter 12, verse 12, wisdom belongs to the aged with length of days understanding. When, you're, when your life is lived in service of the Lord, in his word, walking in his spirit, caring for his people, when you're, when you're a believer and you've lived a life in service to God the way Daniel did, Daniel had much to add to any who wanted to hear. He had so much experience, so much knowledge, so much wisdom. You see, as we age in the things of the Lord, we have much more to give of the Lord to other people. I was speaking to my own pastor, Chuck Smith, many years ago now. And as I was speaking to my pastor, Chuck, I asked him a question. You see, when Chuck was 65, he had declared, he had stated, he had told us, he had now announced to his pastors and all. He said, you know, I'm getting near the age of retirement. And, and I thought, 
retirement. I didn't know pastors retire. I didn't know. Where do you put them in? Old pastors' homes? You know, wouldn't that be a bunch of old pastors taking offerings from one another? I don't know if I want to go to one of those places. So I was speaking to my pastor, and he had said that he was going to uh, consider retirement. And I can tell you it was in 1992. I was teaching at a pastor's conference up in Lake Tahoe, and he and I were sitting together and having breakfast, and I began to speak to him. And I said, Chuck, I said, you have been talking about retirement, um, and yet you seem to be changing your mind. I'm just wondering what's going on. And and as we had our conversation and all, I eventually asked him a question that he gave an answer to me that I have never forgotten. I said to him, well, Chuck, when is it time to retire? When is it time for a pastor to retire? When is it time for a spiritual leader to step out? Because I don't want, as a pastor, I don't want to stay uh, a minute longer than I'm supposed to. I want to know, what should I be looking for? So that the day comes that I can transition and move on. What what? So he looked at me and he said, and I've never forgotten this. I said, Chuck, when should a pastor retire? And he said, when he stops loving what he's doing, when he loses the joy of what he's doing. He never lost the joy of what he was doing. He never retired. He actually died as he was preparing a study to give for the next, you know, within a couple of days. He died preparing a study. He died in not in the actual act of it, but in the process of it. And so I learned a while back that uh, there's nothing wrong with growing older. Perhaps I might have some listening to me right now, perhaps watching online if they can see, because um, some of you are... Anyway, <laughs> and some in this room are older When do, you, when do you hang up the spiritual boots and take your, take your ease? You don't. You don't. You have more to offer every day you walk with Jesus. Every day you walk. That's what Chuck told me. Yeah, amen. That's what Chuck told me. He said, David, he said, every day I walk with Jesus is another day of growing to know him, which gives me more opportunity to share what I've learned of him. So those of us who are older, don't feel that you're to be put on a shelf. Don't feel that you're not useful, because you are. Why do I tear up? Because I'm old. Why do I tear up? <laughs> because I was at a pastor's conference a few years ago, and some of my friends were teaching, and, and uh, it was posted online by one of the younger Calvary pastors, one of these old fossil's going to get out of the way. A Calvary pastor saying that about his elders, saying that about those who have been in the field working hard for so many years. When are you going to get out of the way so that we can take over? And you know, that attitude is wrong. It's just a wrong attitude. Daniel was 90 years of age, at least, and he distinguished himself because the Spirit of God was strong in him. And he's placed, he's elevated to a place of leadership. In, in Psalm 71, 17 and 18, it reads, O God, you have taught me from my youth, and to this day I declare your wondrous works. Now also, when I am old and gray-headed, O God, do not forsake me until I declare your strength to this generation, your power to everyone who's to come. That's the attitude that the, those who are growing older ought to have. And, and Daniel had spent a lifetime in a disciplined pursuit of the Lord. And the fruit of that was that God entrusted him with godly influence. In Proverbs 22, verse 29, do you see a man who excels in his work? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before unknown men. Well, honor comes because of the quality of your life, not because you have simply been placed there, your honor, real honor comes because your life has earned honor and God has given to you that position. And the position that you hold may be respected sometimes, the position itself, but the person holding that position may not be respected. There are, there are, there are those who, who hold office that you honor the office, but you don't 
honor the person holding it. But on the other hand, when you have integrity, uh, people in authority may recognize it. And as they do, they may place you in a position. In Proverbs 3, verses 3 and 4, it says, Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. So Daniel distinguished himself through the spirit in his life and his discipline. He was disciplined to live a godly life. First Timothy 4, 7 says it like this. Reject profane and old wives' fables and exercise yourself toward godliness. So his character was obvious, and he was placed in a high position. And so he is now placed in a great position. He had an excellent spirit, and the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. Well, verse 4, so the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful nor was there any error or fault found in him. Then these men said, we shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Not everybody rejoices when an honorable person is placed in rule. There are many who prefer wicked rulers and the reason that they prefer the wicked rule is because they themselves are wicked. We see that in the United States. Under normal circumstances, a good official is valued, even desired. Because when they're in leadership, they're a blessing and benefit to others. Proverbs 29.2 says, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked are in power, the, the people mourn. Well, in this case, the officials didn't like the fact that a foreigner wielded such authority. So in order to remove him, they had to come up with a plan. But the problem was they couldn't find anything wrong with him. They could find no charge. It says in verse 4 that he was faithful. He was without error. He was without fault in his business dealings, meaning he was trustworthy. He didn't neglect his duty. He wasn't corrupt. He was an unusual politician. Now, remember, integrity will always have its detractors. Daniel had integrity, and his integrity of heart guided his daily affairs. He was uncorrupted by the world's standards. Why? Because the standard he held to was a higher standard. He was a man, when you read of his life, who was in daily pursuit of the Lord. It reminds me of Psalm 63, verse 1, where it says, Oh, God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there's no water. He was a man who was thirsty for the Lord, and so he would pursue him, and he followed after him. But notice verse 5, they had said, we shall, we shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it uh, against him concerning the law of his God. The only way they could attack him was over his life and service to, to the Lord. Now, these men were undoubtedly much younger than him. They wanted advancement, but Daniel blocked their desire for career advancement. So there's a problem with him, and I guess this is a problem we, we see even in our day. Sometimes people are blocked for a similar reason. They say, this guy's too religious, and Daniel was just too religious. You see, the problem was this old warrior was too good to, to find fault with. So what can they do to eliminate him? I know what we can do. Let's use the law. Let's use the law to get to him. And so what they did is they created a conflict between secular law and the fact that Daniel kept God's law. They created a conflict be between what the law of the land said and what God had told Daniel. We have that today too, don't we? Indeed we do. Daniel was making choices, and you'll see that choice. We're all familiar with it already, and his choice was to honor the Lord. And so what do they do? Verse 6, well, these governors and satraps thronged before the king and said thus to him, King Darius, live forever. All the governors of the kingdom, all the administrators and satraps, the counselors and advisors, have consulted together to establish a royal statute 
and to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree, sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. Well, therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. And so there was their plan. Now, there they are, this, this group of people, this good-sized group of people. They're presenting their plan to the king. It, it, it appears that their request was that they could not pray to a god, but only bring their request to him. And he would then be regarded as a mediator to their god, in that only he could pray for that month. And so this was intended to, to give him a sense that he was being honored. It was intended to flatter him because it was a way of recognizing him as having divine powers. History reveals, I was looking this up today, that uh, Persian kings often made claims of deity. And so this was acceptable to him. But they are flattering him. Remember Proverbs 29, verse 5, a man who flatters his neighbor spreads a net for his feet. Remember that because sometimes people want to get something from you and they flatter you in order to make you think that they really think these things that they're saying when in fact they're simply buttering you up, we used to call it buttering you up, in order for them to get something they want from you. And that's what they're doing. Well, he signed, notice in verse 9, he signed the written decree. Verse 10, now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home and in his upper room with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as was his custom since early days. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplications before his God. They got him. He fell into their trap, they think. So Daniel knew that the law had been written. He knew that the law had become effective. And he knew that it was law. And even though he knew that it was the law, he determined to serve God. And this is where we find the secret of his faith. He was disciplined in the word of God. He was disciplined in prayer. And by being disciplined in God's word and in prayer, he revealed his dependence on God. You see, from his youth, he had been accustomed to praying three times a day. The psalmist in Psalm 55, verses 16 and 17, re said this. He said, as for me, I will call upon God, and the Lord shall save me. Evening and morning and at noon, I will pray, cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. So the habit was to pray three times a day. He'd been doing it since he was young. And so he understood. He understood what was about to take place. He knew that he was going to be caught. Notice with me. In verse 10, how it says that he, he went home and in his upper room he, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, what he did wasn't in secret. What he did was very open. If you want to see me, here I am. So the windows were open and people could see what he was doing and he understood what was going to happen. But even though he knew what was going to happen, he still prayed. No matter what the penalty, nothing was going to replace his devotion to God. And it would seem that he must have known Jeremiah's words of promise. In Jeremiah 29, verses 11 through 13, uh, Jeremiah wrote, I, I, God was speaking, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. And that's what he's doing. He was seeking, and he knew he would be finding the Lord. So again, what gave him the ability to put his life on the line like this? And the answer is a simple one, a lifetime of seeking God. Remember with me that spiritual maturity is not instantaneous. It doesn't come easily and automatically. Spiritual maturity develops over a lifetime. And the habits that you form as a youth are the habits you will keep through your, the rest of your life. And in his life, he had the habit of, of making sure to be praying, and he did so three times a day, knowing that he was now going to be watched and knowing 
that this would cost him his life. Spiritual maturity does not come automatically. Spiritual maturity comes by taking what God has said, putting it into practice, and learning the deeper things of the Lord. People want to know the deep things of God, and the way the deep things of God are normally discovered is by simply obeying the simple things of the Lord. When you do the basic things, you actually develop an understanding of the deeper things. To know the will of God and to do it is what God has called us to do. And as you do the will of the Lord, you begin to incrementally understand some of the deeper things that come through simple obedience. And a lot of people don't seem to understand that. It's like people want to go to, uh, we'll say, a uh, jujitsu school, and they want to walk in, in in the first day and come out the next day with a black belt. It just doesn't work that way, does it? It takes a lifetime to perfect a skill like that. And yet we think that, or people can think, that, well, automatically I've been a Christian for a long time, therefore I must be wise. And, but, but, but Daniel gives us an example. He was a man who was known for his discipline, a man who was disciplined over a long haul. He had pursued God over a lifetime. And at the age of 90, he was doing the things at 90 that he had done when he was a young man. And all of those years of accumulating experience with God and moving according to the ways of the Lord had made him a very strong warrior. And even if he was a weak man, he was very powerful in God. And that's what happens. Even though he was aged, he was powerful. He was powerful because this God is powerful. And when they said, you cannot do this, he said, watch me. And he opened up the window. Watch me. Now, notice with me that he wasn't out there thumbing his nose at people as they walked by, you know, say, look what I'm doing. Ah, you know, I'm brave. You're not. He wasn't doing that. He was simply doing what believers do. He was practicing his faith. And uh, you're not going to grow spiritually mature overnight. It's going to take a lifetime. And then when you finally begin to realize that you've grown, it's, it's almost going to be like you'll be surprised by it. You know, I for the longest time, I can speak on a personal level for just a moment about this, for the longest time, when I would read the scriptures, the scriptures speak about being children, little children, young men, and fathers. First John 2 speaks of that. Little children and young men and fathers. And, and he speaks concerning three stages of spiritual maturity. I have to tell you, you know, I, I know what it's like to be a little child in faith because when I got saved, that's what you're called. And then you become the, uh, the young men. The young men are, 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 are men who actually put their faith uh, in action, and they're, like, they're, they're the warrior class of, of, of the spiritual life, the young men in that particular portion of Scripture. And the elders, uh, it just says to them, and you fathers have known him who is from the beginning. And, and when you read about the younger men and you read about the little children, they, they have you know, several words that describe them. But when you look at the, the fathers, you have known him who's from the beginning. Then he repeats it. He says, and you fathers have known him from the beginning. And I didn't understand that as a younger man. But as I grew older, I began to realize that there is a, a certain reality of aging in Christ, of following him uh, for a long time, moving in the same direction. And that was Daniel. It didn't come automatically. It doesn't come automatically. It's part of an everyday kind of thing where you get up, you seek the Lord, and you do the things of the Lord every day. Do you want to grow? Do you want to be mature? Do you want to be somebody that people respect, that will look at and say, this person has integrity, this is somebody I can trust? That's how it happens. And that's how it happened with Daniel. This was his custom since early days. You see, Daniel yielded to someone greater than the government. Daniel yielded to God. Isaiah 46 verse 4 says, even in your old age, I will be the same. I will bear you up when you turn gray. I have made you and I will carry you. I will sustain you and deliver you. I will hold you up when you turn gray. Um, I used to have people approach me saying, how come your hair is dark and your beard is white? Do you dye your hair? Anyway, so <laughs> the, the answer to that is no. I, where I get my hair cut, uh, the barber I've known 
barber for 30, 38 years, and uh, he's very dear to me. And, uh, and he told me that. He said, you know, one of the people here go to the church, go to your church. I said, really? And he goes, yeah. He goes, and she saw you. And she came up to me and she said, I just got to ask you, does Pastor David dye his hair? <laughs> and he says, no, you know, only my hairdresser knows for sure. <laughs> and, and he says, no, he doesn't. And for a long time, you know, I looked at the, those, those phrases, the gray hair. I don't have gray hair in my beard. It is white, and it's been white for a long time. Um, but I know the symbol of it, symbolism of it, and that's a, it's a, it's a gray hair is an honor, especially when it is it comes through pursuing the Lord over a lifetime. And it's just a symbol of that. And, and so this person here is speaking in Isaiah. He's speaking, how God is saying that I'll carry you. But what he has done, Daniel's done, is he, he, he put his trust in the Lord. And he knew in this circumstance who the one he was to obey. It reminds me again of Acts chapter 5, 29, where it says, Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. So God was being honored. And Daniel determined that no matter what the cost is, he's going to honor God. Let me tell you a quick story. It's a history. It's a historical story. It's true. It's about a man named Telemachus. Telemachus was a Christian. I'll read it to you was a Christian who had been stoned to death in Rome when he tried to stop a contest between gladiators in the arena. He entered the stadium while the games were in progress and, going down into the arena, attempted to separate the combatants, crying out in the name of Christ, stop. The spectators were infuriated, and they stoned to death this messenger of peace. He saw, see, he, he was, a, he was a, um, a monk, and he had gone to Rome, and Telemachus had never been to this great city, and he went to an arena while he was there and never seen the gladiators. He was a very innocent man, and he had lived in isolation, just worshiping God, learning the things of the Lord and the ways of God and the love of God, and, but he had felt a sense that he would go to Rome, and, and so he did, and when he went to Rome, he saw them going into the arena, some some uh, historians believe that the arena they went to was the Colosseum. This was around 404 B.C., or rather A.D. 404, the year 404. And, and he went in, and when he went in, he saw the gladiators. And, and I was reading today one account of Telemachus, how that he saw what was going on, and, and, and it was so startling to his tender soul, he, he couldn't handle it to see what they were doing. And so he jumped into the arena is what he did. And he tried to separate the combatants. He tried to stop them. He'd say, stop in the name of Jesus. Stop in the name of God. Stop. Well, at first, they thought, the, the people who were watching thought this was an act. They thought he was like a clown, like a rodeo cowboy clown that they have in the, in the rodeo. They thought it was just entertainment. So they were laughing when historians said. But then they realized that, no, he wasn't, he was, he wasn't a, a part of the act. What he was was really sincerely trying to shut this down. And they got mad. And the spectators got angry because they wanted to see combat because combat was to the death. And so they began to boo and to yell, and stones came. One account says that one of the soldiers, one of the gladiators, began to swing his sword at him. Others, another account is that they, they took a spear and, and thrust him with it. And then this other one is that they threw stones. But at any, in any case, what happened uh, is he fell to the ground in his last breath, we, he said, in the name of Christ, for the love of God, stop. And he died. History records that people sat in silence. And then it began to hit them what had happened this gentle monk, all he wanted was for this bloodshed to stop. And one by one, people began to stand up and leave the arena until there was just this little body of this little young monk laying on the dirt, dead. And the emperor, Honorius, decreed 
Never again shall we have gladiatorial contests. That's how the gladiators stopped fighting in arenas in Rome because of one Christian who said, for the love of God, stop. See, there's a lot of power in righteousness. There really is. When you, when you say, I'm not going to be part of that. That isn't going to be the way I live. I, I'm not going to make a judgment on you for the way you live, but that's not the way I'm going to live. Because as a believer, I, I'm not going to applaud the things that, that lead to, to death. I'm not going to applaud those things. This young, this young he was a young, young monkey. He, he knew nothing of this. He, he, he lived in a different place, and he went to Rome, and he saw it firsthand. And, and, and the, the wrong of it really, really hit him. You know, there are Christians today, many today, who are not startled by the evil. They can sleep right next to it. They can pay money to go watch it. They're not startled by the evil at all. They participate in it. They don't think anything of it. It's because the world has gotten into hearts deeply sometimes to the point there's no conviction. And what I see today, if you don't mind, I'll speak in this way for a moment with you. It's on my heart. I might as well say it. I think that the church is at the point right now where where we, the church, not just this place that we meet, the church in America, maybe even the world, we got to wake up to the days we're living in. We, 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 we really do. And a lot of Christians will not take a word of correction. They don't. When, when, <laughs> when you read the word to them, they'll even fight with the Bible itself. And, and what they'll do, and I, I, why do I say this? Because this happens all the time. It's because, oh, that's your opinion. That's your opinion. Well, I heard somebody else say this in a different way. That's the way we get out of conviction is we kind of just move. When I was a little boy, my dad only spanked me a couple times. And he says the reason I didn't spank you is I just didn't want to kill you, you know. But he only spanked me a couple times because I was very hard to spank. I, my dad, I still remember, he took me by the hand one time and he's going to paddle me. And I kept jumping towards him. Every time he put his hand down, I jumped at him so he couldn't hit me. So I just kept moving. Every time he'd put his hand back, I'd just jump. <laughs> and he, it's true. And my dad eventually started laughing. He, he couldn't stop. And he said, just go to your room. Just go to your room. That was my dad. You know, so uh, I knew how to jump out of the way of chastisement. I knew how to get out from underneath it, just dodge it. And so when I got saved, it was easy for me to make excuses as to why it's okay for me to do this because that was a pattern of my life. And I finally had to learn to do something. I had to learn to be still because when the Spirit of God operates, you need to be still. How do I know that? Because I was 14 once and I had a bad appendix. And I went to the hospital, and the doctor performed surgery. And I was on the, uh, on the little gurney, the bed, whatever it's called. And I still remember he, they had given me this um, a spinal, and they also gave to me uh, some, some, some gas that put you to sleep. And they had said, count from 100 down to 1, and then I had gotten to about, 90 and I was out but then I remember distinctly waking up when the doctor said to the nurse scalpel yeah and I remember him taking it I, I, I saw him they put the scalpel in his hand like this he plunged it into me and I was out I was I was out the second I saw him him cutting me up like a turkey. And when he, when he did that, later as I grew older, 
the Spirit of God taught me something. Let me share it with you. He said, when the Spirit is operating, stay still. Because I would dodge out of the way of conviction like anybody else would. I didn't like it. I didn't want it. And so I would argue with it and fight it. Over time, I learned to be still so that I might know that he's God. And the way that that happens is when conviction comes, instead of blaming, because I was very good at blaming everybody, instead of blaming that person here or my mom there or my dad here or my brother there or whatever, to finally saying, it's my fault. I did it. I was wrong. God forgive me, a sinner. It's a big step in your life when you learn to do that. It is. It's a big step in your life when you learn to do that. Because a lot of people in the church, when they get convicted, all they do is leave. They go someplace else that will not make them uncomfortable. They usually say things like, I just didn't like or what. No, you were convicted. And because of the conviction, I don't want to hear that. Where's the love? They're so judgmental. I didn't think that doctor was judgmental when he sliced out the thing that was going to kill me. I thought that he was really acting the part of a savior because if that thing burst, which it did in his hand, when he pulled out my appendix, my mom said, you know, the appendix burst in his hand. She said, that could have poisoned your whole system. You could have died. But when he cut it out and removed it from me, he saved my life, even if it seemed cruel when he did it. Even if it seems cruel because he sliced me open and removed a part of me, he took that part out of me that was killing me. And conviction is that way. When the Holy Spirit works in your life, he's removing something from you that hurts you. And a lot of people say, no, I want to keep this. This is my pet. I can keep it under control. I only use it on the weekend when I'm out with my friends. No, no, this pet is going to kill you. It's like that woman who caught that wild animal, the raccoon. She thought it was a great little thing, great pet. And then one day it's clawed her from her eyes down to her throat because it's a wild animal and they at a certain point they're not domesticated they may look cute but they will slice you up and we try to make our sins into our pets but eventually what happens is the pet turns on you that's what happens you thought you could turn that guy around didn't you you thought that bad guy was you're going to make him a good guy didn't you and did he become a good guy? There's a lot of girls who's in this room, perhaps, who could say, no, he didn't. He was still a jerk when he left me. Because you can't make him a good person. That is not your project. That's the work of the Lord. But sometimes we think God's punishing us because he knew how much I loved him. When God said, no, that's cancer. I removed it from you because it was going to destroy you. And there you are, crying yourself to sleep at night for somebody who doesn't even think of you anymore. And that's what happens. Am I lying to you? No, I'm not. So if you're going to grow in the things of the Lord, you have to do the difficult thing. And it requires discipline. Hold fast and do the right thing. And Daniel was doing the right thing. You see, what happened here is under Persian law, once it had been enacted, it couldn't be changed. In the book of Esther, in chapter 1, verse 19, that verse says the laws of Persia and Media cannot be repealed. In the book of Esther, chapter 8, verse 8, it says, whatever is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's signet ring cannot be revoked. And so this is not going to be changed. It cannot be changed. And so Daniel was praying. He was caught while he was doing it. Verse 12, and they went before the king and spoke concerning the king's decree. Have you not signed a decree that every man who petitions any god or man within 30 days except you O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. And the king answered and said, The thing is true, according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. So they answered and said before the king, That Daniel, who is one of the captives from Judah, does not show due regard for you, O king, or for the decree that you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. O king, Daniel is flaunting the law. He's rejecting not only the law, but he's rejecting you. What kind of man is this that you are trusting who so easily disrespects your authority? Well, Darius could do nothing because Persian law 
was binding. I want you to know that Darius wasn't angry like Nebuchadnezzar had been towards Daniel's three friends. Instead, he got angry at himself. He even tried to find a loophole to set Daniel free, but the effort was fruitless. Daniel's enemies would not relent. And so verse 16 tells us the king gave the command and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, your God whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. I can't alter the order, so I have to fulfill the law's demand. But he says, your God will deliver you. When he says, your God will deliver you, one commentator said that can be translated, your God must save you. In other words, I, I've tried, I tried, I tried to save you. I failed. It's up to your God now. Only he can save you. In Psalm 68, verse 20, it says, God is a God of deliverances, and, and to God the Lord belongs escapes from death. So he's saying to him, you, you serve him continually. Surely he'll deliver you. Undoubtedly, he'd heard of how, how God had delivered Daniel's three friends, and surely the God who saved them would save Daniel. And so he, he says, your God whom you serve continually, he'll deliver you. Verse 17, a, a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring, with the signets of his lords, that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. The lion's den, one, one commentator described it in this way. He said it was a large square cavern under the earth. It had a partition wall in the middle of it, it was furnished with a door, which the keeper could open and close from above. By throwing in food, they would entice the lion from one chamber into the other. And then, having shut the door, they would enter the vacant space for the purpose of cleaning it. The cavern is open above, its mouth being surrounded by a wall of a yard and a half high, over which a person could look down into the den. And so that was the den he was in. In verse 18, now the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No musicians were brought before him. His sleep went from him. He was very upset. He stayed awake all night. He didn't have the usual diversions a king would have. He didn't have a banquet. He didn't have music to entertain him. He just went to bed and he couldn't sleep. Verse 19 the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice, a mournful or a grieving voice to Daniel. The king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to deliver you from the lions? This man is extremely upset. He's grieving. He's mourning. He believes this gentle man is dead. And so he's crying out with this lamenting voice. And then Daniel, verse, verse, uh, verse 21, Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. Imagine that. I mean, that would, anyway. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth so that they haven't hurt me because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. So what he does is he calmly speaks out of this darkness because he's looking down. It's early in the morning. He can't see. The king can't see. And he says, he says, my God sent his angel. The, the same one who delivered my friends delivered me. In Psalm 34, verse 7, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. God protected Daniel and Daniel gave God the glory. In Psalm 91, verse 14 and 15, because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. And so God delivered him and Daniel has given all praise to God. And it says because in verse 23, because he believed in his God. And so what happens? Well, the king gives the command and they brought those men who had accused Daniel and they cast him into the den of lions. Them, their children, their wives, the lions overpowered them, broke all their bones in pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the den. <sighs> One last thought I didn't bring up, he believed his God. In front of the unbelievers, 
Daniel gave praise to God and was a witness. In Hebrews chapter 11, verses 32 and 33, what, shall I, what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon and Barak, Samson and Jephthah, about David and Samuel, the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions. Daniel was a man of no compromise. Even in the face of death, he wouldn't hide his faith. In Matthew 10, 32 and 33, whoever acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. Whoever disowns me before others, I will disown him before my Father in heaven. I really believe, once again, that, uh, that we, the church, need to be more upfront with what we say we believe. I think that the uh, closet Christian, the era of closet Christianity has got to end. It's got to end. One of the elements that I was taught and trained in and believe and still preach and teach because it's true was that uh, declaring who the Lord is, is is the obligation, responsibility, and privilege of the church. We have that responsibility. God has entrusted us with his message and commanded us to give it to others. We all have friends. We all have family who don't know the Lord. All of us do. I do. We all do. How are they going to be saved without a preacher? How are they going to be saved if we don't tell them? How are they going to know God? How are they going to know God? If we don't say, God, give me wisdom, give me an ability, give me strength. But God, I want to be faithful to you. I had a boss. I had a boss that was, was really not a good guy. He was a bully. And he bullied, he, he bullied me verbally, tried to demean me, and was very successful at it. But I began to pray for him. And I said, you know, Lord, um, help me to be a witness. And one day I walked into his office, and uh, his son was with him. And... We were talking, and he knew that I had served in the military. We began to speak a bit. And he said something to me about my faith. I was going to Biola at that time, Christian College in La Mirada. And he, he kind of mocked my faith because he thought he could. He was, like I said, he was a bit of a bully. And I said to him, I said, how is your life, by the way? How is your life? I live a good life. I said, you live a good life? Yeah, I said, let me tell you something. I said, you say you live a good life. I said, probably because your wife has been faithful to you, right? Yeah. And you've got the son right here. He's a good kid, right? Right. Because you've got a business and it's keeping you afloat, right? Making some good money in your business, right? Yeah. What are you going to do if your wife goes out on you? What are you going to do if your son turns out to be a, a little bit of a hoodlum? And what are you going to do if your business goes down? Then what are you going to have? Are you going to have the joy and all that you say do you have right now? Are you going to have that then? Can you have that then? You won't have that then. You won't have that then because you don't have the Lord. And when you have the Lord, you can have joy. What you have right now is not joy. It's satisfaction at your current circumstances. And you've got to be willing to say things to people even if they don't like it. Why do you think God put me here as a pastor in a church? Can you tell the truth? Because it's truth that sets you free. And that's what you want, right? And that's why I told my dad. And that's why I told my mom. And that's why I told my sisters. That's why I told my brother. That's why I told the girl who became my wife. That's why I told them. Because they needed to know Jesus Christ. They needed to be saved. And the church needs to wake up right now because electing a new governor or electing a new president isn't going to make this a righteous nation. What makes this nation righteous is the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that's why we've got to remain faithful to preach the gospel. That's why. That's what transforms lives. And this man, Daniel, was willing to put his, his, his faith on the line for the things that he believed. We need to understand that. There are those right now who are putting their faith on the line. I have received a message from a friend. We have 22 underground pastors in Afghanistan. Only two have been able to escape. The Taliban overran the country so quickly 
Now they're trapped. Most do not expect to survive. We're trying to find a way to rescue them. It looks impossible. Another wrote, the Taliban is going door to door, and they do not believe that they're going to survive the next couple of days. And it's been reported that over 200, some 229 Christian missionaries are scheduled to be executed. They are putting their faith on the line right now. There are brothers and sisters, our brothers and sisters in the Lord who are daring to be Daniels, who are daring to be Daniels. And we have people today get so upset because I had a guy leave our church many years ago. You know why? Because I changed this, the church times. He said, I'm old time Mexican. I eat menudo at 930 and now you're starting the church at 930. Can't come. I said, I hope you choke on your menudo. <laughs> <laughs> Something as simple as that. Something as simple as that. So I better close. Verse 24 to the end. Um, actually, um, verse 24, he gave the command. That just shows you the kind of man this is. They were all destroyed. The whole. It was those who had lodged the, um, the, they were the chief conspirators and their families, not all the 120 and their wives, but it was the chief conspirators who were thrown into the, into the fate that they had planned for, for Daniel. Then, verse 25, King Darius wrote, To all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell on all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and rescues, and he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth, whom has, who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So he celebrated Daniel, and he said, the God of Daniel is great. And therefore, he's saying, Daniel, in essence, is not to be mocked, nor is his faith. And it's interesting how he puts it. In verse 26, when he says, I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. It's not that they were going to have a national transformation of all of them becoming followers of the God of Israel, but it was a respect that he was calling them to show to this man because Daniel's God is the true God, and he's making that clear. He is the living God who is able to deliver him, and a God like that you must respect. And then finally, it says, Daniel, verse 28, prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. In other words, Daniel, through his faithfulness to God, was given further opportunity to serve. And as he continued to serve, he had further opportunity to bless the people of God. We'll close there. And Father, we just would ask, we would just ask that you would continue to work in our lives. And Father, we would lift up to you those I just mentioned, those missionaries, those Christians, that one city that was the largest Christian community that is, that is under such an onslaught even now, Lord. I lift all of them to you. And, and, and the psalmist said, Rescue me, O Lord, from evil men. Protect me from men of violence who devise evil in their hearts and stir up war all day long. I pray that your protection would be upon them, Lord. And I ask, Lord, for your mercy. I ask for your mercy. I lift up this nation. I, I pray for this, our fellowship. I pray for those who are watching online right now, Father, that we would take the faith of Christ seriously, that we would live for Jesus, being aware of the fact that we've been living in, in very confusing times, but they're becoming more and more clear as each day goes by. There is, there is a war against you but lord we are with you and you are for us work in our hearts lord and even as our eyes are closed our heads are bowed there may be some right now in this room who who need to get right with god and i want to pray for you if you need to get right with the lord you can do so online also as you're watching but in this room if you need to get right with the lord Right now, would you raise your hand? Let me pray for you right where you're at. Father, you see these hands. You know the reason they're being raised to you. I ask in Jesus' name that you would reach down and touch each, each person whose hand is raised. And Father, cleanse 
Wash them by the blood of Christ. Fill them with your presence and your spirit. And Lord, I ask that you would use them for your glory. May they be living testimonies of your goodness from this moment on. And Lord, we receive, as we confess our, our failures to you, we receive your forgiveness. Thank you for reconciling us with yourself. And we will follow you. And we thank you. Bless you, Lord. You can put your hands down. And Jesus, please keep moving in us to your glory in your name. Amen.